We'll get started here. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see everybody. My name is Marianne Murphy-Zarzana, and I'm an associate professor here in the English program and the director of our creative writing program. Today we're del delighted to present a conversation about poetry with poets Marianne Corbett on the far left, Athena Kildegard, moderated by Susan McLean, professor here at Southwest. I'd like to first acknowledge that we have President Connie Gores with us today, and we are very appreciative that she is joining us, um, especially because we are celebrating our 50th anniversary year at SMSU. We started in 1967, it's 2017, and we've been celebrating our homecoming, and what we're celebrating tonight is 50 years of literary excellence at SMSU. And there's so many people right here in the audience who are connected to that. Um, my heart is just bursting. And um, we're just standing on your shoulders. And I just want to say that um, our two visiting writers here today, they have participated in past, um, the past Marshall Festival, which is our literary extravaganza. Um, we have high caliber writers drawn from all across the nation. And we have this every several years, and so we're very pleased to have them come back for this. Now I'll introduce our three writers. Mary Ann Corbett was born in Washington, D.C., grew up in McLean, Virginia, and has lived in Minnesota since 1972 and in St. Paul since 1986. Trained as a medievalist, and linguist, she earned a doctorate in English from the University of Minnesota and spent almost 35 years working for the Minnesota legislature as an in-house writing teacher, editor, and indexer. Her poetry is widely published and has won such awards as the Willis, Willis Barnstone Translation Prize and the Richard Wilbur Award. She is the author of three previous books of poetry, Breath Control, Credo for the Checkout Line in Winter, love that title, and Medieval, as well as the chapbooks Gardening in a Time of War and Dissonance. And her most recent book just came out is Street View. <laughs> Athena Kildegard's previous books are Rare Momentum, Bodies of Light, a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award, and Cloves and Honey. She received the LRAC McKnight Fellowship and grants from the Lake Region Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board. She teaches at the University of Minnesota Morris, and her most recent book is Ventriloquy. And both of those will be available afterwards for purchase and signing. Susan McLean is a poet, a translator of poetry, and a professor of English here at Southwest Minnesota State University. She graduated from Harvard University with a BA in English in 1975 and from Rutgers University with a PhD in 1990. Her work has appeared in Calliope, Atlanta Review, The Formalist, IAMs and Trochies, Ariane, Measure, The Classical Outlook, Literary Imagination. She writes in the field of formalism. According to an interview with the Poetry Foundation, she describes her love of formalism as, I am addicted to the esoteric pleasures of rhyme and meter, and I don't even try to deny it or camouflage it with slant rhyme. She has been portrayed as a new formalist by many, if not most, noted critics of her work. Her poetry books include The Best Disguise, The Whetstone Misses the Knife, and her translations of short Latin satirical poems by Marshall, Selected Epigrams. And I will give you these three poets. Hello, I'm Susan McLean, and I'm delighted to be here with Marianne Corbett and Athena Kildegard and uh, I'm delighted that you've all come tonight, too. I'm going to start by asking the poets, how does one of your poems start? Could you talk about what triggered the poem originally? 
how you knew that it would be the seed of a poem and read the poem for us. Athena? Great. Hi. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm glad you're, you're here in the audience. I do want to say you're like such Minnesotans that you're sitting way in the corners and almost no one in the front. So it's, it's challenging to look around and, and get you all in my, in my sight lines. If you feel like moving, I'll, I'll page very slowly to the poem that I'm going to read. <laughs> and then, yeah, that would be great. I know you students in the back here being shy, but. Um, so my new book, uh, Ventriloquy, not, um, uh, consists of uh, four different poem sequences. And one of them is a sequence that imagines saints. So these are um, poems that are just thinking about a pretend saints. So if you know anything about the saints, um, they were martyred for something that they did. Um, anyway, so these are imagined saints, and they, uh, they, they are not formal. They don't rhyme, um, but they, they belong together. So all the, the poems start with a title which runs into the poem itself. And the one I'm going to read to you is called The Saint of Boredom. And this poem starts by uh, reminding us of one of John Berriman's dream songs, which begins, life, friends, is boring. We must not say it so. A line I really love. John Berriman, maybe you know, taught at the University of Minnesota for a long time. So that, um, that was one of the sparks for this poem. The other spark for this poem is that it's part of a sequence. So I had written other saint poems, and I was thinking about uh, potential saints for our times. And um, because I teach, I often hear students say, I shouldn't say often, I occasionally hear students say, oh, that was boring. <laughs> and um, my mother-in-law was famous for saying, uh, you know, it's not boring, you're boring. <laughs> So I would never say that to a student. But, um, and you know, we're getting all this news now that people aren't bored enough. Like we're all so wildly busy, we don't enjoy boredom like we, maybe we need to. So, you know, all this stuff was on my mind when I wrote this poem, so I'll read it. The saint of boredom agreed with Henry, even at the end, flames leisurely tickling her flesh. She yawned. Everyone yawned. A great, contagious yawn. A sympathetic yawn. It took all afternoon and into the evening. Hard to stay awake, someone said. Oh, yes, said someone else, yawning. Standing here for so long, I feel like a horse. I could fall asleep. Horses are never bored, someone said. How can they be bored? Flies, breeze, a pail of oats. Those with blinders, someone pointed out, they must be bored. I suppose you're right, the pail of oats said, yawning. Soon enough, everyone wandered away. Thank you for that. <laughs> when I hear Susan's question, how does a poem start? Um, first of all, I interpret it as a general question, and then I get flustered because there are so many different kinds of things that can trigger a poem. So I've attempted to create general classes. First is the general class of stuff that happens, and it wallops you and you must write a poem about it. Either you write it right away, uh, or you find out that that's a mistake and you revise a whole lot later. Uh, and, or you, you mull it for a while. But for example, three years ago, my husband had a cardiac arrest right mm. in front of me. There is a poem about that in here. Um, the other general class is the sort of thing that happens repeatedly. 
you see a thing or you experience a thing on a, almost a daily basis and it carves a groove in your head and eventually that forms for some reason. And sometimes the reason is something that you read. Um, something will make the experience gel so that it will become universal or metaphoric and then you know you have the seed of a poem. A friend of mine is a science writer and I read once in one of her postings to New Scientist this sentence. <laughs> Astronomers have spotted lonely planets wandering in the dark space between stars hurled out of their own forming solar systems by the violent actions of their larger neighbors. And my city bus riding life put that together with things I see every day and gave it the title Vagrant. No actual malice forced him out. The will of God, an accident. When giant powers churn, they rout such lesser beings. He was sent wheeling down unlit alleyways. He has his scars, his injuries, his sidelong moves that mirror ours. We find it hard to track a gaze blasted with scraps of bygone war, or watch his faintly pulsing hopes, lacking the anchor hold of stars, drift out of range of telescopes. I hope you get the picture. <laughs> Each of you deals with form in your poems, but often in very different ways. Marianne, I noticed that you write in a lot of fixed forms, some of which are very common, such as the sonnet and rhymed couplets, and some much more unusual, such as Anglo-Saxon accentual verse and sapphics, both of which originate from other languages and have different rhythms than English speakers are used to. Could you read one of the poems in a common form and one in an unusual form and talk about why you chose that form for each? How does form affect the way you write? Since you mention sonnets and Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse, um, those are the two I'm gonna to choose to read. Um, I have a habit of saying that I choose to write sonnets when I'm really mad at something. Hmm. There's something about the tension of what I'm feeling that goes well with the tightness of the form. Uh, then again, that happens not to be true of the sonnet that I'm about to read. And I chose the form for this because it's a situation that has what poets would call a turn or a volta in it. The mood changes mid-poem. And so it was suitable for the sonnet form. It's called State Fair Fireworks, Labor Day. I hope some of you at least have been to the State Fair on Labor Day. Look up. Blazing chrysanthemums in rows shriek into bloom above the tilt of whirls, hang for a blink, then die in smoky swirls. They scream revolt at what the body knows. All revels end. We clap and sigh. Then, no, another rose, another peony, break, flame, roar, as though by roaring they might make the rides whirl in perpetuum, as though we need not finally wearily turn to plow back through the crush of bodies, the lank air, to buses that inch us sweating across town as though we were not dropped in silence there to trudge the last blocks home, the street lamps low, the crickets counting summer's seconds down. 
Am I still mm -hmm. audible enough? Yeah, everything okay with that? Thank you. <laughs> and then again, there's this piece of Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse. Um, and that came about in the following backwards fashion. It isn't a matter of the subject fitting the form. Rather, a group of us together were playing with the form. A group of poets on the online poetry forum called Erratosphere, which is the first place that Susan and I encountered each other's work. We were just messing around with Old English verse, uh, and I came up with a version of this, which is the most unepic, un-Beowulf-like sort of thing you could possibly imagine. Um, and it sat there on the forum for a number of years until finally I revised it, got it published, and here it is in this book. It's called Spoon Spell. From the dank deeps under dampened compost, to my amazement, there now emerges, almost unspoiled, a metal spoon, stainless steel, from the ancient stash of our wedding booty. Wondering how it came there, I mull, and memory mumbles. The sandbox sat there, out of the sun, and the great excavations of small engineers ate hours of summer, ages ago. Not a sound now of summery childhood stirs in the yard. Instead, these strangers, tall and tense and text message crazed, very occasionally visit their elders, chewing on worry, stirring up change, spinning out life in spoonfuls of latte. Thus worketh weird with its usual weirdness, spoon as measure of their dreams and mine. But let stealth and steel wool act in this story, buffed, burnished, and back in the drawer, let the spoon re-up with the regular ranks as though double decades could disappear. Athena, you have written a whole book, Rare Momentum, of syllabic poems using the syllable count based on the Fibonacci sequence, but more often you write in free verse. You also tend to write poems that are part of a sequence, however, and I'm sure that that shapes your choices as you write. Could you read a couple of your poems and comment on the issues of form that affected you as you wrote them, how do you decide that a poem should be part of a sequence, and how does that affect the other poems you write in the sequence? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you for that question. <clears throat> yeah, I suppose part of why I write sequences is because I'm obsessive. <laughs> and so, so it answers you know, the obsessive quality of my brain. Um, uh, uh, sequences also just give you material, right? Once you begin writing a sequence, um, that's the thing you're working on, and and it um, it's like filling up a bathtub. You just turn on the faucet, and then the next thing you know, you're sort of um, warm and cozy in all that water. Um, uh, I, that maybe didn't work, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so sequences also mean, I mean, when you sit down to write, you have nothing often, and you have to start with something. And so if you're writing poems in a sequence, you automatically have something, you have this given, right? So in the case of the Fibonacci's, I wrote the first one, and that was fun, and then I wrote a second one, and then pretty soon I'd written a lot of them. And, um, and it was because I sat down, and that's what I had to write. I'm in the middle right now of writing a sequence of poems that's drawing its titles from uh, phrases by the surrealist artist Rene Magritte. And I wrote the first one, and that was fun, so I wrote a second one, and now I've written 68 of them or something like that, so you can see how obsessive I get. Um, 
So, uh, and, and it's challenging also because you, ha you're, you don't want to repeat yourself. So you're looking for new ways within whatever the, the form that you're working with. So um, I think, you know, that's the several attractions of writing in sequences. So I thought I would read a couple more saint poems since I started with one of those. Um, so here's the saint of merchandise. Uh, so this is a poem that's sort of thinking about our, our capitalist culture and, um, you know, how we all, we, so, no, I shouldn't say all, many of us imagine we're going to find happiness by going shopping. Um, and then we don't usually. The saint of merchandise came in bulk, all of her at once, reached a developmental milestone early, well before anyone noticed. Hardly noticed herself, so busy was she greeting herself as she came, inspecting herself as she went, wrapped herself tightly, see-through straitjacket. She couldn't be touched. We took scissors and knives to her, jammed them, drove them in, found ourselves bereft after. The saint recuperated, glided past, glossy, half off today only, and tomorrow when it's today only. <laughs> so um, here's another one uh, in this sequence. Um, and this one, uh, so I've been, th I I've been thinking about our social media culture and the way we're all putting ourselves out there so much of the time. And, um, and that in conjunction with this uh, marvelous poem that Emily Dickinson wrote, I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Um, and how Emily Dickinson was okay with being nobody. And you know we're living at a time where we're maybe not okay with being nobody. And then in the middle of thinking about these things, Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, OD'd on heroin. And um, the story was that he uh, was maybe seeking something of oblivion, right? That his fame put him in front of us more than he was prepared to manage. So this is a saint poem um, that is riffing on those things. And the last line of the poem is a pileup of words that are all names for heroin. The saint of oblivion slipped through the door, swung the stile, jumped the gangway, slick as a whistle, slick as a doorknob, slick as not, zip. Z, zilch, zero, the big O, 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 to go there, fly high, sail the seven seas, thought the saint, O, oh, to be nobody. Polaroid, eight millimeter, time bomb, bombshell, O, oh, O, oh, O, oh, the saint said to himself, to be nobody. Instead, the saint was somebody, oblivion, not an option. Oh, 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 yes it was. Main line, straight line, all the way to El Dorado, Elysian fields, the new Eden, paradise. Now we watch reruns, pray for relapse, pray for release, shoot up, shoot up, shoot up. Oh, 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 the saint whispers. Oh, the waves, the wind, the drift, the blow, the shush, the whiz, the drink, the drift, the pulse. Both of you have written about music in your poems. Athena, you write about playing piano, and Marianne, you write of singing. How do you think that your relationship to music has affected your poetry writing? Marianne, me first. Yeah. The, the primary effect that music has on my poetry writing is that I'm a meter addict. I <laughs> cannot even start a poem unless I decide 
what rhythm I'm going to adopt first, whether it's an iambic, trochaic, dactylic, uh, sapphic, um, one of those or, or something I invent uh, has to happen really before the flow of words starts. And iambic pentameter is like turning on a faucet, as you have said. Um, on the other hand, I have also tried to write about the sensation of making music, um, the way one is lost, for example, in the middle of a choir or an orchestra. And there are poems about that in my second book, Credo for the Checkout Line in Winter. Um, but most of my music making has been for the church. I have sung in the choir of the St. Paul Cathedral for many years. And for some years, I was also a cantor there. And those have created experiences that end up in poems. This, from my third book, Medieval, is one. It's called A Paid Engagement. This job one does alone. The call comes without fanfare, funeral. I pick up youngest boy and sudden. Nothing especially hard to do. Standard selections, proves, Gounod, the planning rushed, the choices leaden. So why the hearts leap to the gullet as I arrive? The great oak door? Weight planted on both feet, I pull it. The weird alone but not alone echo decaying on the stone of heels on a patterned marble floor. Not now. Vesting quickly, we priest, server, cantor, organist, make up the face of liturgy, ordered as Newton's universe, impassable as God, composed until we reach the psalmody, the hubris of it. How do I dare sing to these people, I will fear no evil, watching as they sit, their heads bent with the weight of it. Why bomb, dear God? Why useless bomb? Why not the 22nd Psalm? I am poured out like water. See, my bones are dust. My heart is wax melted within, wild dogs Hungry circle, thugs close in in packs. The real song for the Shadow Valley. Eli Lama Sabachthani. But rubric or reserve prevails. I pour the balmy 23rd like salt into an open sore, and as an acid afterward, the 91st. You shall not fear again that line, the night that falls. Last him, they sift out of the space. A tiny dowager, all hump, passes the ambo. She looks up to mouth the words with me, her face utterly open, raw. My note wobbles, grace sticks in my throat. Thank you. And Athena. I almost forgot what the question was after that after beautiful that music. Poem. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, so um, Susan's right, I play the piano uh, and um, I think the main thing that does for me is uh, that when I am working on revising a poem and I'm feeling challenged by it and um, maybe I'm struggling and I'm not making sense of a line or I can't find the right word, then I will go in the other room and play a little uh, Bach or Mozart, somebody with some music with lots of notes 
and that requires my brain to completely shut off from the poem and focus entirely on the music. And, um, and it's physical, right? So my hands are moving, my body's moving. And then uh, more often than not, when I return to my desk, I can solve the problem, the, the problem that was niggling at me before I sat down at the piano. And I think it, I think it, there's probably uh, physiological reasons for this, you know, synapses firing across the two hemispheres of your brain or, um, you know, something about the, getting your body um, moving and certainly taking my mind off of it, even though, of course, your mind is not. Your mind is still, um, you know, wrestling with the problem, but it's been set in the background. Um, so, and, and then, um, like Marianne, I write about music, too, from time to time. Music slips into my poems. So I thought I'd read uh, a poem, a love poem, that has music in the background. So I lived um, with my sweetheart, my husband, in Chicago for, for um, some years, and we loved to go to a, a, a blues club called Teresa's and listen to the blues. This is a poem with no title. Before we were stopped by cops, a black man humoring his white partner on 47th in the ghetto, we'd been drinking stiff gin and tonics at Teresa's, blues club with a mural of a lion roaring out from between a naked woman's spread legs. Late, when all the other white folks had paid up and gone, a skinny man, old enough to have great-grandchildren and two hobbies, left three floppy-breasted women and whiskey setups and asked me to dance. The blues do not require touching. A gangly bassman wedged his slow-burning cigarette between D and G, moved his long-boned, ringless fingers, soft and patient along the neck. I was a white girl from a small Corn Belt town trying anything. The old man moved sure from the hips an easy does it butter glide. Which of the three women would he lie down beside later, the three sirens with whiskey sevens who paid him no mind, nor me either? We danced the blues oblivious, gone, a slow mojo, and my husband watched from our back table, gone too, until two verses in, one of those women called to him to dance, and he did. Oh, he did. I saw slow, so slow, the blues got him, too. I noticed, Athena, that many of your poems have a setting in nature and that you also write often about travel. Would you like to discuss either of those or both concerns in relation to one of your poems? And what does nature or travel represent to you as a writer? Hmm. Great, complicated question. Um, I do write about nature and I write about travel, uh, mostly because I love both of them very much. I spend a lot of time outdoors. Uh, I take my notebook with me out to the wetlands uh, that are east of, of Morris. Um, and so nature imagery gets into my poetry quite a lot. Uh, and I, I think for a variety of reasons, one just because of the sheer beauty of what's out in the natural world. And um, I, I, I like looking at it so that it gets into my poems that way. Um, and I travel quite a lot, so my travel gets into my poems too, although often not immediately. Um, it, it often shows up much later after I've sort of been thinking about what I found out from my travels. And maybe that's something I've learned because I think it's too easy. Uh, you know, when we, t many of us when we travel, we're not there for very long. And that means that you don't really get to know the place in any deep sort of way. And so I think writing about travel can often be, become stereotypical 
and um, so I, I fight against that. So I thought I'd read a poem uh, that actually draws on both things. Um, this is a, a poem, uh, an, uh, that's not in this book. It's 50. Um, this is a poem that uh, um, tells about a time uh, when we were in Mexico, when we were driving down a highway in sort of north central Mexico, and, and there was a monastery uh, that was kind of in ruins just off the road, and there was no sign anywhere, there was no tourist bureau, there was no information at all about it, it just stood there empty, um, and had probably been standing there empty for a couple hundred years, and so we, we just, we, we got off the road and wandered around inside that monastery. Um, so this, and this poem, because it was in ruins, um, some of it had been taken over by the natural, you know, the plants that were growing there. In what remained of an Augustinian monastery south of Zacatecas, just off the Silver Road, we walked the Stations of the Cross beside limestone porticos, pocked and scarred, a fountain crumbling in the patio below. We stood in a long corner room where one gaunt window opened to sear fields and fences of ocotillo cactus. Commodes of stone squatted in a row along the outer wall. We spoke of how Luther wondered at God's love while sitting on the privy. Some things require solitude. Today, decades later, I think of that emptied place, how quiet it was, as if still in meditation of the red hollyhocks against a stone ledge and the swallows careening across the canted roof. I think of the two of us, novices in the world, how vivid that memory, and I am astonished at the mystery of love. Thank you, and Marianne, your latest book, Street View, seems to focus on poems in an urban setting, often St. Paul, where you live, but sometimes other cities. Would you talk about your feeling for city life in connection with one of your poems? I like to describe myself, well, I have a habit of describing myself as the world's last living adult non-driver. <laughs> so, that has meant that in 35 years of working for the Minnesota legislature, I spent a lot of time on buses and recently also on light rail trains, but mostly buses. And on city buses, you see everything that the city has to offer. You see incredible diversity, you see incredible poverty, incredible inequality, uh, rather impressive wealth, and all together on the same bus of a morning. So I have a lot of poems about that in all of the books, um, but they rather congregate in, in this latest book. On the other hand, um, I don't travel often, and that means that when I travel, it's likely to be one of those walloping experience so that despite what Athena says <laughs> about the danger of stereotyping, um, I feel walloped and I do produce poems about special sensations I may get in a strange city especially. And so there's a Boston poem in the book and there's a New York poem in the book and I'm going to read the New York poem. Um, it has an epigraph that reads, a visit to New York with apologies to Percy Shelley. And you will remember that Percy Shelley wrote Ode to the West Wind. The poem is called A Slightly Defective Ode to the West Side Why. O oh, noble entry on West 63rd, whose image beckons from the internet in brownstone arches, breathing not a word of shared baths, skimpy towels, and toilette 
too redolent of dorms back in the day. Oh, great location, frugal nightly net of rate plus tax. Oh, bright five-starred array in blandishments, ratings that claim I'll cop a tidy bargain for my three-night stay. Oh, plain and simple, nothing over the top. Yo, West Side Y, I'm talking, listen up. <laughs> which seems to be the more appropriate phrasing since all this O oh, is more than slightly twee, but I digress. Done with the eyeball glazing nonstop to JFK from MSP, I'm here, admitted to your inner sanctum, lugging my wheelie toward the mystery. The clerk has offered me my key, I've thanked him, Clueless within the labyrinth, I wander. Those fantasies I had, they're gone. You've yanked them, O oh dim halls, clanking radiator thunder, archaic carpets dark with ground in gum, wet bathroom floors. Later that night, I ponder the howls of student athletes having fun. I fantasize about a loaded gun. But morning, look to the right and Lincoln Center gleams like the castles of les très riches oeuvres, while opposite, the seasons turned inventor of pointillist impressionism, a blur in Jonquil and Forsythia, magnolias and calorie pears and red buds all concur, winter is over. Several cardinal scholars chant early alleluias to the frou-frous of Central Park, the human centifolias, the garden social registers and who's who's. Temperatures saunter toward the 70s and marathoners blossom in pink tutus crossing at the museum. There's a breeze. What jaded critic sulks at arts like these? So it's a wash, dear Y. No, it's a steal. How can I whine about the noisy nights and soggy floors when all New York's more real now than it was? Look, when a poet writes, West Broadway glitters in a mist of rain, I know now with exactness how the lights conjure that disillusion in his brain and yellow cabs whoosh past him, three and four abreast. An image trumps a bulky drain. It plants Manhattan in the deep heart's core. A solidness I didn't own before, which is the reason I'll be flying back some spring to come to start the day on Broadway on Dante in the Starbucks line and take my almond Danish and my steaming latte under the gold green trees at 63rd to sip beneath the measured gaze of Dante. Yes, I'm Midwestern, fashion setless, stirred too slowly for this town's up-tempo zing, fuddled by subways, gawking, and absurd, but coming back in spite of everything, wired up and giddy as this longed for spring. Many people today feel that poetry is not relevant to their lives. What do you think that poetry has added to your own life? When and how did you first become committed to it? Athena? So um, earlier today, I was upstairs in Bellows admiring the um, case of all of the books of poetry by people uh, who have taught here at SMSU. Bill Holm, Leo Dangle, Adrian Lewis, um, people whose poetry I've been reading since I was we. <laughs> and, um, I've been really lucky in that way to be sort of surrounded by poetry, you know, in my life. I grew up in a home where both of my parents read poetry. My dad taught poetry at Gustavus, um, and and 
Bill Holm was one of his first students and came through my house many, many times when I was growing up. Always uh, part of the visit involved reading poetry out loud. Not just Bill reading to us, but all of us reading to Bill too. Um, so, so that's been an amazing gift in my life. But uh, I didn't really get, I didn't become committed to poetry, I don't think, until I was um, in my late 30s, really, when I um, won a fellowship to attend a writing conference in central Mexico and then went back the following year to do it again. Um, and that, those two super intense weeks of working with some um, marvelous poets uh, who, who validated my own sense of being a poet and what I was doing sort of turned um, turned me really into somebody who uh, I I guess I just realized poetry wasn't you know a sideline poetry was it <laughs> the th the thing that I needed to to be attending to almost every you know pretty much every day of my life um, so that's when that happened uh, why. Um, I, I think, I, I actually think people don't realize how much poetry does mean to them. And I mean, you, you in your beautiful poem about singing at the funeral mentioned the 23rd Psalm. How many of us can recite some or all of the 23rd Psalm? Most of us can. It is gorgeous poetry. Does it mean something to us? Yes, it does, right? Um, and I think we forget that because we, we begin to think that poetry is this thing that's untouchable that you know people in New York City write and it doesn't mean anything. That's hooey. Poetry reaches, you know, there's poetry that we're not gonna like just as there's music we don't like or art we don't like. But when we find a poem that speaks to us, it will stay with us the rest of our lives. And I really do believe that most of us have those poems um, with us. Um, so, yeah. Um, what has it added to my life? Why do I love poetry? I love poetry because it involves words, and I love words. <laughs> and I love uh, the fact that we speak one of the most interesting languages on the planet, this crazy polyglot language that's borrowed words from so many other languages um, and that has its roots deep in um, the spoken word, right? Um, and I, I, it's so deeply interesting to me to think about words and the power of words, and I believe in that. But I also have discovered over the years that when I begin to write a poem, maybe I don't know what the poem is about exactly or what it is that is niggling at me that makes me want to write the poem. But in the process of paying attention to the words that I'm using, I discover what it is that I'm thinking about, that, that's what it is that's on my mind. And that's what I love about poetry. I think more than any other written form, uh, poetry is about the words um, in a super close way. So, yeah. It's been fun to discover where we can play with contrasts uh, <laughs> as we mm -hmm. do all this discussing. And unlike Athena, who grew up in a house with poetry, uh, I had parents with very little formal education. So when I discovered poetry as a teenager, poetry was my thing, my thing to make myself uh, and to assert my independence, my individual soul. And it was extremely solitary when it was thus discovered, but that is when I fell in love with it. Um, like Athena, I didn't get committed until later, uh, quite a bit later. I basically left poetry aside to get graduate degrees and to raise children and to be a full-time employee of the legislature. And only when the kids were grown did I really come back to it. And I came back in the nurturing environment of the Eratosphere Poetry Board so that I can honestly say what poetry has added to my life is not just the wonder of the words, as you say, but a community, mm -hmm. encountering other poets, encountering people who like poetry and come to listen to it, 
most of those people are also poets, and that's just fine with me. But um, <laughs> the sense of oneness, the fact that I've got 635 poet Facebook friends is <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, so if I may, I think I'm going to read a poem that came into being uh, a number of years ago on the Eratosphere Poetry Board, was workshopped online by the folks I met there, including Susan. Mm -hmm. Lament for the midnight train. Night train noises, muffled and low. Nights when the Northern Limited left. Midnights, we'd hear its strange chord blow, a distant dissonance, treble cleft. Languid in summer, dulled in snow, it spoke to me calmly, trust and rest. The night world works on a steady clock. The barges ride on the river's crest. At port in Duluth, the grain ships dock. And a street lamp lit at the end of the block looks in at the windows blind from the west. I never learned. Did the schedule skew departure times into daylight hours? Or did neighbors grouse as neighbors do that living close to a loud sound sours tempers and lives? I never knew, but it's not there now. Though we still see track, the freeway sound and the freeway grime color the nights. The snow turns black, and the block club frets over rising crime. And the sweet illusion of changeless time, though I wish for it fiercely, will not come back. I'll ask each of our poets to read one last poem of their choice. Athena? Oh, all right. I'm going to be naughty and read two, but they're really short. Um, so I'm just going to read two poems from this new sequence that I've been working on. So um, the titles are phrases um, written by the French surrealist artist René Magritte. So this one is called Gave Birth to Flame. In the room wallpapered in white swirls, we ate, each from our own bowl, a private ventricle offering of popcorn brought to life in a pan whose handle had long ago broken from its aluminum cuff. Our father kept a tennis racket chairside in case during Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom or the wonderful world of Disney, a bat strayed from the river's mosquito plenitude came, furred in body and smooth of wing, through the room, making no intentional sound, but bringing, nevertheless, things to an awkward halt. Okay, so this one's way different. This one's called Speak a Language Other. Sherry, cherry, Vassar drinker, this du mon bachi tutu? Oh, la luna, la luna, putti tutti in plaster bonum dentures, cowabunga in vino veritas, monchisi vert and dicta, spell it, my fruit vendor, mangia luna, drink to monte dulce, decorum be damned, this pulsing dada, this lunar sapien sapiens, all agua et in om, at om in pluribus. We're going to clap for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you got two shorts, I get a long one. <laughs> two shorts and a long one. Pancakes. OK. I have not found the ideal placement for this microphone, so I hope you will bear with me. Um, this one came to be during my years of graduate study at the U of M Twin Cities campus. It's called Weirdos, and it's epigraphed Minneapolis circa 1973. 
the talker, I remember. There were more eternal campus oddballs, almost mythic in common room and beer chat, but we saw the talker. Stories were cautionary, tragic, and malleable. A dissertation blighted, a prelim failed, and still he clutched the magic wand of the scholar. On the quieter nights, his swooping voice lectured to empty floors in classroom buildings or in the dead lights of library stacks, deserted corridors, the walk above the Mississippi, bustling, pulsing, intense as 20 full professors, coat patched with duct tape. One detail was puzzling. Each of us seemed to hear spurts of his own discipline, a sort of razzle-dazzling every field in the plunge or drone or buzz of the voice, as though the devil were at play with each one's fears. But how his pale eyes shone, how passionate his gestures in the walkway. And if you met the eyes at night alone, you thought the void that sucks the soul away and wondered briefly if you'd see the line between intense and crazy when you breached it with your own obsessions. We're all fine now, those who remember this. We teach for just enough to live on, for the muse, for science. Tenure has floated out of reach. I think of him when shooters make the news. Well, thanks to our two speakers, and thanks to you all for coming. Uh, let's have a round of applause for them. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions for them, feel free to ask. Jan? Every year on campus, we have a poetry reading in the month of March, women's poetry, and it's always been Susan who organizes mm -hmm. this and selects the women poets. Well, this year, Susan is the poet we'll be featuring. Oh, so yeah. So she'll have to listen <laughs> to a lot of people read her poetry aloud. Neat. So I'm thinking as I listen to you, what's it like for you? It doesn't happen often. Uh, usually, uh, it'll make me thoughtful. It'll make me ask a question. I'm, I'll be lucky if uh, it's in the sort of sec setting where I can corner the person and say, um, how did you understand that line? I heard it when you were reading thus and so. Uh, as I say, I'm lucky if that happens, but I'm, I'm glad if it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. It doesn't happen very often. Maybe, maybe we should make it happen more, uh, <laughs> more often. I've had um, the good luck to have Garrison Keillor read a few of my poems on the Writer's Almanac, and he's a wonderfully understated reader of poems and um, has the kind of drawl delivery, which I don't. So um, it's, you know, it's fun to hear um, your poems interpreted by somebody else. I also, I, I really think of my poems as going out into the world the minute they're published, and they're not really mine anymore. Ditto. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I, I had a poem turn up on a erotica blog one time. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? I mean, I don't think of my poetry that way at all, but there it was, right? So, so you, 
there they there they go you know yeah I'll add I think that just one time I had Garrison Keeler read one of mine and I was thrilled that he could hear the five beats in the line mm. and made mm. them audible. He's really very mm. good at mm -hmm. that. Um, and as a side note on interpretation mm -hmm. of the poem, um, I was, I've been surprised by uh, a student who, as an assignment, translated a poem of mine into German. And uh, he wasn't uh, a native speaker of English, so we had conversation back and forth via email, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of uh, not just slang, but fairly ordinary um, specialized English um, mm -hmm. that w we had to tussle about and get straight. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that's a special situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also had a poem set to music, mm -hmm. a kind of music, um, a synth or, or very um, metallic sounding uh, music of a kind that I have like no experience with. So it, it took me aback, sort of, but um, you want to be surprised. You want to be whacked over the head at least once in a while by this mm -hmm. stuff. It's a great question. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm going to add on to that, too. I, um, some students at Luther College took uh, one of my saints, the plastic saint, and turned it into a motion poem. Um, and the voiceover that they used was of a, like a grandmotherly sounding voice, which was absolutely not how I heard the poem, not at all. So that was so fun to see how they thought of the poem. I mean, it was completely, it made it new to me, right? Yeah. I'd also add that a poem is rather like a musical score, that somebody writes it, but each person reading it or performing it is giving it their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. it, it's just part of the territory. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. I have to ask, who are your favorite poets? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> um, it's a kind of question that I might answer differently uh, at any given time. Right at this moment, my favorite poems are Anthony Hecht hmm. and W.H. Auden. Uh, I'm reading a lot of Hecht to prepare for a presentation, and uh, so I've just got reams of Hecht uh, in my head, um, and I'm loving the way he plays with words constantly, loving the way he creates mixed meter poems um, where every line is a different number of beats, uh, and yet there's a rhyme scheme to it, and it's a very unpredictable rhyme scheme, so it's, it's like juggling seven balls. Uh, doing that and wordplay and sonics all at the same time, it sort of takes the top of your head off. So that's why I love him right now. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with you, Marianne. It's a, it's a hard question. Um, because it does change in some ways, but I can tell you who are the poets on my shelf who I take down the most often. Um, and of the, of the older bunch, the older debtor bunch, um, would be Walt Whitman, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, George Herbert, um, Emily Dickinson some. Uh, um, yeah, the, who are the poets who, when I find out they have a new book out, I go and buy it before the book's even available. Uh, a poet named Robert Wrigley who writes about the natural world. He lives in Idaho. I worship the ground he walks on, although I met him once. He's kind of a pain in the butt, but um, I, I, I love his poetry. Um, a Canadian poet named Lorna Crozier. I adore, massively, massively adore her and would follow her around if I could. Um, yeah, so those are two, you know, there are others, but <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I'll throw in Richard Wilbur while I'm at it. Mm. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Is there any question you'd like us to ask? <laughs> <laughs> there was a question. Oh. I just want to yes. ask a question. I just want to say thank you, Sarah. That's sweet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Doug. What's a question you want to ask? How many of you here write poetry? <laughs> More than half, like I guessed. <laughs> and that's great. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I get to meet those of you who do write, um, and those of you who don't. You know, mm -hmm. Please come up and talk. Mm -hmm. And we do have books by the poets that are for sale. So if anybody wants to buy some, uh, feel free to come up, and they'd be glad to sign them for you.